somebody taught you. So I took the experiment out of Delhi and repeated it. This time in a city called Shivpuri, in the center of India, where I was assured that uh, nobody had ever taught anybody anything. <laughs> so it was a warm day and uh, the, the hole in the wall was on that uh, uh, decrepit old building. This is the first uh, kid who came there. Later on turned out to be a 13 year old school dropout. He came there and he started to fiddle around with the touchpad. Very quickly noticed that when he moves his finger on the touchpad, something moves on the screen. And later on he told me, I have never seen a television where you can do something. So he figured that out. It took him over two minutes to figure out that he was doing things to the television. And then, as he was doing that, he made an accidental click by hitting the touchpad. You'll see him do that. He did that, and the Internet Explorer changed page. Eight minutes later, he looked from his hand to the screen, and uh, he was browsing. He was going back and forth. Um, when that happened, he started calling all the neighborhood children, like children would just come and see what's happening over here. And by the evening of that day, 70 children were all browsing. So, eight minutes and an embedded computer seemed to be all that we needed there. So, we, we thought that this is what was happening, that children in groups can self-instruct themselves to use a computer and the internet. Um, but under what circumstances? At this time, there was a, a, a... The main question was about English. People said, you know, you really ought to have this in, uh, in Indian languages. So I said, what? H have what? Um, uh, shall I translate the internet into some Indian language? That's not possible. So it has to be the other way about. But let's see, how do the children tackle the English language? I took the experiment out to northeastern India to a village called Madantusi, where uh, there, for some reason there was no English teacher. So the children had not learned English at all. And I, I built a similar hole in the wall. One big difference in the villages, as opposed to the urban slums, there were more girls than boys who came to the, to the kiosk. In, in the urban slums, the girls tend to stay away. I left the computer there with lots of CDs. I didn't have any internet. And came back three months later. So uh, when I came back there, I, I found these two kids, 8 and 12 year olds, who were, uh, were playing a game on, on the computer. And uh, as soon as they saw me, they said, uh, we need a faster processor and a better mouse. <laughs> so, 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 so I was a little surprised about you know, how, the, how on earth did they know all this? And they said, well, we picked it up from the CD. So I, I said, uh, but how did you understand what's going on over there? So they said, well, you've left this machine which talks only in English, so we had to learn English. So then I measured, and they were using 200 English words with each other, mispronounced but correct uh, usage, words like exit, stop, file, <laughs> save, that kind of thing, not only to do with the computer but in their day-to-day -day conversations. So, uh, Madantusi seemed to show that language was not a barrier. In fact, they may be able to teach themselves the language if they really wanted to. Finally, I got some funding uh, to try this experiment out uh, to see if, it, if these results are replicable, if they happen everywhere else. India is a good place to do, it, to do such an experiment in because we have all the ethnic diversities, all the, you know, the, the, the genetic diversity, uh, all the racial diversities, and also all the socio-economic diversities. So I could actually choose samples to, to cover uh, a cross-section that would cover practically the whole world. So, so we went, I did this for almost five years and, uh, and this experiment really took us all the way across the length and breadth of India. This is the, the Himalayas, up in the north, very cold. I also had to check our, our invent an engineering design which would survive outdoors. And I was using regular normal PCs. So I needed different climates for which India is also great because we have very cold, very hot and so on. This is the deserts to the west.
near the Pakistan border. You see here a little clip of uh, one of these villages. The first thing that these children did was to find a website to teach themselves the English alphabet. Then to central India, very warm, moist fishing villages where humidity is a very big uh, killer of electronics. So we had to solve all the problems we had without air conditioning and with very poor power. So uh, most of the solutions that came out used uh, little blasts of air put at the right places to, to keep the machines running. I'm going to just cut this short. Uh, we, we did this over and over again. Uh, this sequence is also nice. This is a, a small child, six-year-old, telling his elder sister what to do. And this happens very often with these computers, that the younger children are found teaching the older ones. What did we find? We found that six to 13-year-olds can self-instruct in a connected environment irrespective of anything that we could measure. So if, if they have access to that computer, they will teach themselves, including intelligence. I couldn't find a single correlation with anything. But it had to be in groups. And that may be of great uh, you know, interest to, to, to this group, because all of you are, are talking about groups. So here was the power of what a group of children can do if you lift the adult intervention. Just a quick idea of the measurements. We, we took standard statistical techniques, so I'm going to not talk about that. But we got a clean learning curve, almost exactly the same as what you would get in a school. So I, I leave it at that because, I mean, it, it sort of says it all, doesn't it? What could they learn to do? Basic Windows functions, browsing, painting, chatting and email, games and educational material, music downloads, playing video. In short, what all of us does. And over 300 children would become computer literate and be able to do all of these things in six months with one computer. So how do they do that? Uh, if you calculated the actual time of access, it will work out to minutes per day. So that's not how it's happening. What you have actually is there is one child operating the computer. Surrounding him are usually three other children who are advising him to, uh, uh, on what uh, should they, they should do. If you test them, all four will get the same scores in whatever you ask them. Around these four are usually a group of about 16 children who are also advising, usually wrongly, about everything that's going on on the computer. And all of them also will clear the, a test given on that subject. So they're learning as much by watching as they learn by doing. Seems counterintuitive to adult learning, but remember, eight-year-olds live in a society where most of the time they're told, don't do this. You know, don't touch the whiskey bottle. So what does the eight-year-old do? Observes very carefully how a whiskey bottle should be touched. And if you tested him, he would answer every question correctly on that topic. So they seem to be able to acquire very quickly. Um, so what was the conclusion of all these six years of work? Was that primary education can happen on its own, or parts of it can happen on its own. It does not have to be imposed from the top downwards. It's, it could perhaps be a self-organizing system. So, the, so, so that was the second bit that I wanted to tell you, that children can self-organize and attain an educational objective. The third piece was on values. And again, uh, to, to, to put it very briefly, I conducted a test over 500 children spread across all over India and asked them, uh, gave, gave them about 68 different values-oriented questions and simply asked them their opinions. You got all sorts of opinions, yes, no, or I don't know. I simply took those questions where I got 50% yeses and 50% noes. So I was able to get a, a collection of 16 such statements. These were areas where the children were clearly confused because half said yes and half said no. A typical example being sometimes it is necessary to tell lies. They don't have a way to determine which way to answer this question. Perhaps none of us do. So I'll leave you with this third question. Can technology alter the acquisition of values? Finally, self-organizing systems, about which, again, I, I won't say too much because you've been hearing all about it. Natural systems are all self-organizing, galaxies, molecules, cells, organisms, societies, except for the debate about the intelligent designer. But at this point in time, as far as science goes, it's self-organization. 
but other examples are traffic jams, stock market, society and disaster recovery, terrorism and insurgency. And you know about the internet-based self-organizing systems. So here are my four sentences then. Remoteness affects the quality of education. Educational technology should be introduced into remote areas first and, and other areas later. Values are acquired. Doctrine and dogma are imposed. The two opposing mechanisms. And learning is most likely a self-organizing system. If you put all the four together, then it gives, according to me, it gives us a goal, a vision for educational technology. And educational technology and pedagogy that is digital, automatic, fault tolerant, minimally invasive, connected and self-organized. As educationists, we've never asked for technology, we keep borrowing it. PowerPoint is supposed to be considered a great educational technology, but it was not meant for education. It was meant for making boardroom presentations. We borrowed it. Video conferencing, uh, the personal computer itself. I think it's time that education has made their own specs. And I have such a set of specs. This is uh, a brief uh, look at that. And, and, and such a set of specs should produce technology to address remoteness, values and violence. So I, I thought I'd give it a name. Why don't we call it out doctrination. And could this be a goal for educational technology in the future? So I want to leave that as a thought with you. Thank you.